Can I sort of exercise my, my normal host's uh, privilege and ask the first question? You, you framed this in the beginning with, with reference to Chomsky. And I was just wondering whether there's empirical work in other countries and other languages which sort of bear out that this is a sort of universal pattern of language. It's not just of some sort of peculiar, peculiarly English uh, yeah. uh, form. Absolutely. Conversation analyst starts with action. So quite often people will say things to me like, yeah, yeah, but men and women talk differently. Or it must be to do with culture. Well, the French say it talk differently or something like that. So people start with an assumption that there are going to be those sorts of differences. But we start with action and how actions are built. So if you think about something like a complaint, does a culture have complaints in it? Most cultures have probably complaints or might have complaints. So if we look at how a complaint gets built, it turns out that there probably are different ways of doing it, but they're not different in terms of different cultures. Some languages provide for different sorts of actions, maybe, or different ways of doing an action, but the actions are probably the same right. and constant. Yep. Right, I see quite a few hands, one over there. Well, that was fascinating, thank you very much. What I'd like to know is, how does this transform or transfer to the written word? Do the, do the same techniques apply in the written word? I had a PhD student, Jo Meredith, who is now at Salford University, I'll give her the name check, and she looked at people writing on Facebook instant chat and what she did was live screen capture of people writing uh, and how they were constructing their turns on Facebook and her question was about both what is similar and what is different to spoken interaction and one of the things that she found is very similar for example is as you start to build a turn at talk sometimes you might stop yourself fix it and move on so you might say something like and did you did you because you've said something wrong in the way you've started to build it. And very similar, when you're writing in Facebook, you will start to build an action, monitor what you're doing, and then change it. So, very, absolutely transferable to the written word. One of the best things about her project, she didn't really write about this, because we didn't know what, quite what to say, but it was very interesting, about how many X's people put at the end. <laughs> so, she had videos of people doing X, 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 delete two, po <laughs> post three. <laughs> So there's a whole paper in how many X's and how people seem to decide and, co and calibrate how many X's they're going to put at the end. Okay. Oh, hello. Uh, my name is Tom Lawson. I'm the chief executive of Leap Confronting Conflict, a, a charity that works with young people who are caught up in violence. My question is not about the young people, but is the, uh, my question is around funding for charities. And I wondered if you had done any work around uh, how to go about asking for money, uh, and whether you'd be willing to share that with us. <laughs> if I had done it, I'd be very willing to share it with you, because I'm lovely. But um, there is work on, on organ donation. So I haven't done that work myself, but if you email me, I could send you the, the, the paper. Um, so there is a little bit of work in that, in that territory of getting people to do um, philanthropic sorts of things. So the, the techniques that you show where you annotate things and then you're analysing, is that all done meticulously by hand or is there st sort of computational techniques for doing that these days? <laughs> I get asked that a lot as well. Um, no, you have to... It's, it's the first stage of analysis to produce the transcript. So a computer can't do it. Um, my colleague over here, Ryan, is a phonetician and he's extra specially good at producing those transcripts. Um, but we have to do it manually. There is no shortcut. Maybe one day, but not yet. Okay, in the gallery and then, then here. Hi, that was creepily awesome. And I say, black dress is good, pointy black hat, perhaps not. <laughs> My question is more that uh, software estimation. When I ask somebody, this is something that's almost like this, that I came across by accident. You ask somebody who you want to know how long a project is going to take. They're in charge of the project. They're writing some of the software themselves. They probably know more than you do. They give you an answer, you say, this is the bit that I discovered, was how, how, what factors might make it take longer? And you give them 30 seconds or so to say, well, uh, somebody might be unwell, we might be taking um, a holiday or something like that. And after that, you say, and what chances are that it'll be shorter? Which they usually get a blank look 
because all software writers give you the shortest possible time, which the best I've ever come up with, and IBM has done no better, is multiplied by about two and a half. Now, can you think of a way of improving this or maybe <laughs> or faulting this method? Because I've never found a way of doing it any better. Um, I'm usually reluctant to give advice like that because what I don't want to do is what people would generally do, and that is guess the thing that would work. What I would do is have a look at these conversations, find out the ones where you did manage to successfully get people to do the thing you wanted them to do, and see what was working in those conversations and build the finding from there. It's quite important to not just guess at what might work, but to start with real life and build up from there. So I'm not going to fudge an answer to that. That's, that's my answer. Please. Um, I was curious if there's any research that's done about how different kind of demographic kind of categories affect the way that these play out, especially the demographics uh, or status of the asker relative to the respondent? Mm. So my PhD was looking at gender particularly. So there's loads and loads of research that says that men and women talk differently. And it's quite hard to find that when you look at naturally occurring talk. So you, it's one of those things where you, you can try to make those arguments, but if you look at, for example, how a request is done, so a bit like the, the question that was asked right at the start um, about culture. If you start with action rather than the categories which people immediately reach to, which are going to be the things that they think are going to explain difference, those differences very often fall away. And it's not that something like gender or power isn't relevant to interaction. It's just that we don't start there. We start with action and then see how different sorts of actions get built and how, um, for example, a request is done differently or um, a complaint is done differently or an offer is done differently. And those things tend not to fall away along the obvious categories of gender or class or education. They tend to fall away with different sorts of things to explain them. Please, and then over, over here. Yeah, uh, I'm a medical student and will certainly go Thank away you. with a, a different view on our teaching. Um, but <laughs> you, you spoke about awkward silences in speech being greater than a tenth of a second. Mm. Are there any um, situations where you found that silence is actually an effective method of eliciting a greater response? So, what I would say about silence is that it's a strange... People tend to think of silence as an inert thing. If you're face to face with somebody and there's silence, then it tends to actually be a rather active thing rather than nothing happening. So, for example, the longest silence that I've ever recorded was in a police interrogation, and it was something like 11.6 seconds. And the police officer is asking the suspect something like, OK, Mr. Jones, if you were kicked in the head with the same force that you kicked person X, what do you think the injuries would be? And what they're after is intent. There's a very long silence then. But it's not just like this. Silence isn't that. that the person is moving, they're sort of umming and ahhing and so on. And eventually the suspect says, I can't really deal with that question. So the, the police officer waits it out. And eventually, if you like, the waiting out might get someone to respond, but it might not get the response that you want. Science is also different in different bits of interaction. So, again, if you, if you sort of try staying silent if someone is talking to you and they're, they're telling you a trouble that happened today and you just, just, just stay silent and do that inert thing, that it's going it's to be very odd. It's quite hard to do. So, silence tends to not be the thing we think it is because it's not inert. If you wait a long time in response to an answer, then the other person might start talking. But generally, we don't have that inert silence that we, th that we think silence is. So it doesn't really look quite like we think it might when we look at it empirically. OK, please. Uh, so, OK, Macron's gone over there. Hi, thanks. Uh, I've got a particular conversational pet hate, which is to be honest, or if I'm being honest. I was just wondering if you know how these things begin, and is it likely to die out at any point? <laughs> <laughs> what was the second part of the question? Is it, uh, is it likely to die is out? Is it likely to die out? It it's, it's, um, tends to be idiosyncratic. Some people say things like, to be honest, and others don't. Some people say, to be fair. To be fair is the one I don't like, and I don't know why, to be fair. A colleague of mine at Loughborough, Derek Edwards, has done a whole paper on, to be honest, uh, <laughs> which I can send you. 
And it tends to crop up in particular environments, and it tends to crop up when people are doing what we would call a dispreferred action. And we had one in, in the talk today. So when the uh, caller was saying, I don't want to mediate, she said, well, to be honest, I don't really think they'd cooperate. And we have those to be honests that in turn downs or in those environments where you're doing something which probably wasn't hoped for by the, by the person who was talking to you first. And it's clear that they're doing something interactional in, in that kind of way. So I can send you the paper. I don't know if it's going to die out anytime soon. Um, but they are doing something quite specific in interaction. OK, I've got two more hands up. I've got three more hands up, so let's just go quickly there, there, and then there. Hello. I think I should probably confess that I'm a psychologist. And I was Me very, too. <laughs> <laughs> I was very interested in uh, one of the uh, difficult examples that you gave about the parents with the neonatal mm. situation. Um, I remember reading a few years ago some research uh, that in that situation, uh, parents often find it a lot easier to have a doctor's recommendation because of the guilt. Mm. Um, and I wonder whether the findings that, that you've uh, discovered are about it being a different stage, or, or what, what's that about? Um, it, it's a really interesting question because I think there's a, there's a kind of norm now that patients should be involved in everything and that decision making should be shared and that's a starting position for a lot of training, that that's just become a norm, a bit like you know, child-centred education or something like that or student-centred, that, that somehow the professional should really dumb it down a bit or rein it back a bit because these things should be more equal. Um, I'm agnostic about that in the first place. Some patients want a recommendation, some want to be more involved. So maybe there's some um, adaptation that needs to happen there. The thing that seems to cause the conflict is in the best interests of the child, particularly. Um, and I think the, re the reason for that seems to be that if the doctor is recommend to, recommending something in the best interest of your child, and you want to ask them a question about it that might not be quite what I'm doing following your recommendation, then you get this immediate misalignment between the parties. And you, we have cases where horrible things get said. So the parents are saying things like, so basically you're telling me to kill my baby then. And they don't want to go along with that. So it's the best interests of the baby, which is so foregrounded in the guidance, which seems to cause the most problem in the encounters. Perhaps so, so the recommendation with a diff in a different setting, in a different of context without that is probably better. We also know that when options get listed, as I sort of indicated before, doctors will put probably the thing that they are recommending last, because we tend to go with the thing that happens last. So there are ways of sneaking in a recommendation in a way that seems much more patient-centred. Please. Uh, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I've been just... Um, mostly surprised by your results, but not entirely. But I'm wondering whether your surprise in what you're finding diminishes. Uh, in other words, can you predict at all what's going to happen? Are you finding that any principles are formulating themselves as to what is going on <clears throat> as a generality? Or do you have to take every specific situation, every specific sort of person, um, every specific change of tense and so on, and look at that without any um, I think I'm probably as good as, as other people at, kind, at spotting a, the trajectory where someone is going with the thing that they're doing right now. Other people give, ascribe special skills to conversation and listen, are a bit nervous to have a conversation with you. Um, certainly my mum thinks that I'm analysing her all the time. <laughs> Uh, but I, th I think, no, I mean, my, my, you know, it, it's quite hard to do it live. So uh, the skill is to, to look at it afterwards, to look at the recording and the transcript afterwards. So when I'm actually live in the moment, I'm probably no better than anybody else at just trying to spot where things are going and figure it out and, and have my turns at talk. When it comes to looking at encounters, quite often I'm looking at very specialist sorts of talk. So, for example, the hostage negotiation. I didn't really have much idea of what that would look like before looking at it. Um, real life, again, a bit like the police interrogations that I've looked at, they're nothing like the television. You know, they don't seem to be in a darkened room and no one's doing anything threatening. They look quite different. Mm. So, with some of it, I think I'm probably as surprised as anybody would be looking at a setting which is not my profession and, and trying to understand what goes on there. And one... No, no, okay. One, and one, one last question. 
Um, your dialogue seemed to me to be uh, very theatrical, very filmic, and I wondered if there was any um, playwright or, or a scriptwriter who has appealed to you, inspired you initially or along the way? I, I guess that comes from the fact that the transcript has the speaker and the, and the, the script out like that, but um, I have to say no, um, not particularly. I mean, I kind of get interested in dialogue on the screen, um, what looks particularly authentic and what doesn't look authentic. Uh, so, you know, th those f um, shots of, of television soaps where the, 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 the faces are both there together, they seem to be very close together, which you sort of think that n never looks authentic, and that sort of dialogue where no one is overlapping and no one is sort of interrupting. So the most authentic-looking scripts are the ones where you see mess, maybe, rather than neat, neat sort of joins between all the turns, which we know doesn't really happen uh, in naturally occurring dialogue. OK, well, thank you. It just, just remains for me to thank you so much for super discourse that's been shown by all the uh, questions and issues raised. I'm sorry there have been a few people who haven't had a chance, but uh, I'm sure we'll have you back again at some point to talk about it. So thank you so much. <laughs>